Hello everybody and welcome back to Odin's Movie Blog. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope you're doing well. Today we're going to be talking about one of the worst things that ever happened to the Star Wars universe. And no, you could say, oh, you mean The Last Jedi, right? I mean a specific part of The Last Jedi and that is the infamous hyperspace ramming scene. Now, some people might say, oh, but it was really cool. What are you talking about? From a narrative perspective, from a storytelling perspective, there are severe flaws with that scene and with that moment. And once again, my guy, Matthew Kadish, brilliant writer over at Medium.com. Go check out his articles. I'm going to post a link to this article in the description for this video. But please go check out all of his other works. Um, he's going to be working on a few more few more projects for The Last Jedi, but he's also going to be writing about other films too from a story craft perspective. And what I love about his work is that he focuses on the narrative. He focuses on objective points of view from the filmmaking perspective. So instead of just saying, I didn't like the movie, uh, the movie sucked, or the movie wasn't good, etc. He instead says, this is the reason why the film is flawed, and here is the philosophy and the explanation behind it. So he's a brilliant writer. Go check him out. Go give him a huge shout out. And again, please cl click on the link. I'm going to cover uh, some of the basics of his article. Obviously, I'm going to cover a lot, but I'm not going to cover everything. So please go read the entire article for yourself because he has so many great things in there. So once again, he already he starts off strong. And this is what I love about his, his stuff too, is that he does so much research. He does so much preparation for this work. And you can just tell. He, you can tell that he cares about what he's saying. He believes in what he's saying. And he's not just putting something out there to try and get a rise out of people. He's trying to say, no, there are logical fallacies. There are logical flaws to this film and to films in general, and I want to point them out because I think it is good uh, for the improvement of film overall, and that's why I love his stuff. All right, so it says, Walter Fisher, Professor Emeritus at the Anberg School for Communication, developed the theory which has become known as the narrative paradigm. The narrative paradigm is basically a theory that claims all meaningful communication occurs via storytelling. Audiences participate in narratives as observers receiving information the narrative is communicating to them. Essentially, the narrative paradigm helps us to explain how audiences are able to understand complex information conveyed through a story's narrative. So it makes sense to us that uh, one of the greatest parts of communication, or one of the best ways to communicate to another person, to explain something to someone is through storytelling. That's why you oftentimes will see that people who can't understand a certain concept or can't grasp something, oftentimes the best way to explain it to them is by telling them a story because it helps them to be able to dig deeper into sometimes uh, complex material. The ability to understand information through a story's narrative is called narrative rationality and is made up of two elements, narrative coherence and narrative fidelity. So as you can already see, he's taught he's starting off with very objective terms. He's starting off on a very solid he's starting off on very solid ground and he stays on solid ground all throughout the article. And so he's setting up these two terms, a narrative coherence and a narrative fidelity. He's going to go into one of them specifically and how um, how The Last Jedi specifically and how Ryan Johnson's writing of The Last Jedi kind of just totally blows it out of the water. So here he goes to just describe what these terms actually mean. And that's what I love about his stuff too, is that he goes out of his way to define his terms. And I think that's just something that from an argumentative standpoint, it's so important to define your terms because you can use terms and you can throw words out there. But if the audience doesn't know what you're talking about, if everything is going over the audience's head, no one's going to be able to understand it. And that's why I love Matthew's stuff. So narrative coherence is the degree to which a story makes sense. Coherent stories are internally consistent with sufficient detail, reliable characters, and free of major surprises. Audiences assess a story's coherence by comparing it, comparing it with similar stories. And so basically, that a story makes sense, that everything works, that everything connects to each other. Narrative fidelity, on the other hand, is the degree to which a story fits into the audience's prior understanding. Stories with fidelity do not violate things an audience has come to accept to be true, such as being able to breathe in outer space without the assistance of an oxygen tank, for, exa uh, oxygen tank, for example. So again, yeah, the narrative coherence is talking about the specific, ooh, got some lightning. Uh, so we got the narrative coherence, which is talking specifically about the story itself. Itself. Is the story sensible? Does it all make sense? Do all the things connect to each other? And then you also have narrative fidelity, which is, is there any prior material that this story relies on? And therefore, in order for the story to continue to be strong, to be narratively strong, then therefore it has to be, it has to be, uh, it has to be faithful to the previous material in some capacity, in some way. Again, it can't violate things that previous material in the same universe has already set up as a part of the canon or a part of what's already true according to that universe. When these two elements are respected, it prevents audiences from formulating objections to the narrative based on rational thought. So long as narrative rationality is maintained, so too is the suspension of disbelief. And uh, one of his previous articles talks specifically about how the suspension of disbelief was just blown away in The Last Jedi. Most no 
notably in the scene where Space Slayer comes into the to, to account because it is a scene that no one was ready for, that has no prior justification for its existence, and at that point suspends, uh, rather, the suspension of disbelief, which every person, when going into a film, kind of buys into. Every person, when you go to see a film, especially a sci-fi film, you buy into certain things. You say, okay, well, I know that this doesn't exist. I know that there aren't spaceships like this today. I know that people aren't doing these things, aren't colonizing other planets, but you're willing to suspend that belief for two hours because the movie is setting it up in a way where you can buy into the universe. You're buying into what the story is trying to tell you. And when you do away with that, then it takes the audience out of the film and then it just leads to a lot of problems. So this is talking about formulating objections to the narrative based on actual objective problems with the overall story. And of course, he's going to dive into uh, The Last Jedi in a second. Stories actually utilize more than one type of consistency to preserve narrative rationality for audience, that the story makes sense to audiences. In fact, they use three. These three different types of consistency are external consistency, genre consistency, and internal consistency. So obviously, Talking about consistency here, there are three different levels, and he goes in the article explaining each one and how they're relevant. External consistency, you can think about what are some outside forces that have to be maintained within the story itself. Genre consistency, what is the genre of the film, and what are some genre tropes that also have to be maintained in order to make sense within the story. And then internal consistency, what are some elements within the story itself, a part of the actual narrative of the story, that also must have that consistent narrative to it. It is important that all three of these be maintained by the storyteller at all times to preserve both the coherence and the fidelity in a narrative. Creating self-contradictions in any of these aspects of consistency can destroy an audience's acceptance of the narrative and eliminate the willing suspension of disbelief necessary to enjoy it. So what are these exactly? And that's when he goes and dives into each one and how, how each one is relevant to it. But no, it's absolutely true. Without consistency, without having this narrative uh, constant throughout the story, then the audience cannot buy into the story. It's the same reason why during The Last Jedi, there were several scenes, because obviously after the last video, when I covered the last article, a lot of people said, oh, I was even taken out of it before the Space Leia thing. Um, even though I think Matthew Kadish is very is very wise to say that, no, that's the moment that I feel like the vast majority of people, if you weren't already out of the film, said, okay, what the hell's going on? Because it really is true that because it did not remain consistent, not only based on the prior material, the external consistency, not only within the genre itself, again, obviously the sci-fi genre, it just doesn't really have, based on the film that Star Wars is based in, based on the reality and the constructs of Star Wars, it did not fit. And also based on the fact that the internal consistency, the actual things that are presented in the film itself, at no point in the film did it present that Leia was actually a lot stronger, or it didn't say, oh, she received a lot of really great training, or she knew certain things that maybe we didn't know already existed. None of those things were there, and so therefore the story itself is not consistent, and therefore it is narratively flawed. Again, you can say that you like the film, and we talked about this last time about how uh, how about Ray is and Mary Sue. You can still like the character, just like you can still like the movie. You can still say, well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the film. But you cannot at the same time say, oh, there are no narrative flaws. That is what Matthew Kadish is trying to do. He's trying to say, look, you, I respect your opinion, but your opinion does not uh, subjugate, or rather does not uh, totally outdo all of the narrative facts, all of the narrative flaws that can be proven by using the reason and intellect. So, should any of these, so again, in that time, he, he explains everything. So, should any of these three aspects of narrative consistency be violated by the storyteller, it can create self-contradictions within the narrative that can be that can affect the narrative ration, rationality of all associated narratives, because suddenly the audience is now aware of the contradictions. This brings us to The Last Jedi and the one scene which violated the series' previously established internal continuity. So therefore, he's focusing specifically on internal continuity and how that moment, the Holdo maneuver, or the uh, hyperspace ramming scene, just totally blew apart any sense of a consistent narrative throughout all of the Star Wars films, not just The Last Jedi, but every single Star Wars film that had ever been uh, established up to that point through these series of self-contradictions uh, from this one moment, this one scene. So it's I love, too, how he's able to pinpoint how one particular issue can essentially be boiled down to one particular part. You know, obviously with Rey, or rather with the story of the Mary Sue, it's focused specifically on Rey. When it comes to this, it's specifically on the hyperspace ram. And then when he discussed everything dealing with the issues with The Last Jedi, and the other ways in which The Last Jedi can be very inconsistent, he was able to break it down to saying the dispensation of disbelief was broken by the uh, by the Space Leia scene as well. So let's actually go into it. So, 
And this is where, again, I, I know I know that we've kind of been talking about setting up and prepping for this, but I really do think all that is so important so that what we actually talk about being a part of the film makes a lot more sense. And so now he's actually going to get into The Last Jedi itself. Now, this scene is obviously exciting and visually stunning. Even I've said that. Even, like, I will say in defense of it that it's beautiful to look at. It does not change the fact that it's narratively problematic. In fact, it just destroys so many of the narratives in other films. And one of my favorite parts of this article, and it's going to get to in a second, is when he lists off every single issue that that one scene calls into question. Uh, however, when examined from a story craft perspective, that's the focus of him, it is catastrophically problematic. Those are the best words that could possibly be used for this. And the reason it's so problematic is because the holdover maneuver, the holdo maneuver of accelerating a starship to light speed to be used as a weapon violates the internal consistency of all the Star Wars movies, creating such a massive self-contradiction that it retroactively creates errors in plot logic in every previously made film in the franchise. So not only does it ruin The Last Jedi, it ruins every other Star Wars film that's ever existed. And so we say, oh, that's being a little extreme. How can you say it ruins it? What do you mean by that? From a narrative perspective saying that there are these serious plot holes, these serious errors in plot logic that can now no longer be explained until Star Wars, Lucasfilm, Disney decide to address this problem in the future, which they're probably not going to do, which means this error is always going to be there, which means all Star Wars films essentially are going to be broken until this can be fixed. If the audience is now being told by the narrative that light speed travel can be weaponized in the Star Wars universe, then when narrative rationality kicks in, the audience suddenly starts asking questions that incorporates this new story element into what they know of the Star Wars story they've seen thus far. One question in particular, why in the hell was this not being used before? If one ship traveling at light speed can almost wipe out an entire fleet, why didn't the Resistance evacuate one of their ships earlier on in the chase and use that attack to the First Order fleet, crippling them while the remaining Resistance ships escaped the hyperspace? After all, they knew they'd eventually lose their large ships and the bombardment of the First Order fleet, so why not sacrifice one to save the rest? That's a very great question, and it's one of a series of questions that this one scene, this one action, calls into question and causes chaos with. If light speed travel can be weaponized, why didn't the arms merchants introduced on Cantabite develop unmanned light speed vessels to be used for kamikaze runs so they could sell to both the Republic and the First Order? Surely weapons such as these would be in high demand in the Star Wars universe, right? So again, if this is something that could have been done the entire time. If this is something that could have worked, that could have caused as much damage, why in the hell didn't even these stupid characters on Cantabite, you know, who were selling to both sides of the war, try and make a profit off of it? If this is something that was already preconceived logic. And here we go. Once the Resistance escaped the salt, uh, salt planet of Crate, why didn't Kylo Ren order one of the damaged Star Destroyers to be accelerated to light speed directly at the Resistance base, creating a massive crater that would have destroyed the, the base and everyone in it? Why? Please explain to me, Ryan Johnson, why didn't they do that? Because of everything that you set up with that one moment, because you thought, hey, uh, this would be really cool, but uh, I don't really know how much it's going to make up, but it's going to be fine. No. It, it breaks everything because now it's like, okay, now every movie I see going forward, I'm going to say, oh, just hyperspace ram. Okay, just put a droid in the hyperspace uh, <laughs> the hyperspace ready uh, X-Wing and destroy the, X, uh, destroy the Death Planet, the Death Star, whatever the next giant uh, bio, ball of destruction is going to be. Why, not, why don't you just do that? <laughs> you see what I mean? Like, th this is now just completely made everything about this whole thing uh, just silly. In The Force Awakens, why did the Resistance have to make such a high-risk run on Starkiller Base to destroy it if they could have just had unmanned ships do a light-speed kamikaze run at the base's weak point, annihilating the base's control center and preventing the weapon from firing? Guess what? Also, you could have saved Han Solo that way, too. Oh, man. And once you start to really, like, dive down these holes, every plot point begins to unravel because every movie could have ended, like, 20 minutes in. If this was a concept that you want to accept, then you have to either accept that every single person in the Star Wars Star Wars universe is just dumb, which also ruins it in a lot of ways, or that this was a narrative error. I mean, that's the only really way that you can coincide through. Or you can just say, I still enjoy the movie, but I understand what you mean. Like, those are the only ways that you can really go about this. In Return of the Jedi, so now we can go, like, as I said, it's not just The Force Awakens, it's not just The Last Jedi, it's every Star Wars film. In Return of the Jedi, when it became obvious the Emperor had laid a trap for the Rebellion fleet, why didn't Admiral Akbar order one of the fleet's capital ships to perform light-speed kamikaze run at the uncompleted and vulnerable Death Star in order to save the fleet from the ambush? Why is it that they had to focus on that one little tiny port when all they needed to do was put a damn droid into an X-Wing and say, BOOM! Like, <laughs> 
<laughs> like, oh my goodness. And there are people that defend this. There are people that still defend this. And he's going to get to that. When the Empire learned of the existence of the Rebel base on Hoth, the Empire strikes back. Why didn't they send unmanned drones to it at light speed from orbit to demolish the base instead of launching a full-scale ground invasion of the planet, thus ensuring that no Rebels could escape and that the Rebellion would be destroyed? Why did the Empire extend such a huge amount of resources to create a Death Star if it would have been cheaper and more effective to build a large light-speed capable missiles the size of Star Destroyers to launch the targets in order to destroy them? You could destroy planets with a damn X-Wing. You could you could retrofit uh, one of your TIE fighters with a hyperdrive and just put that through a planet. That, that would destroy the planet. Why, why not use... You can make a thousand, multi-thousands, uh, multiple thousands of those ships instead of wasting it on a damn Death Star. I mean, <laughs> why didn't the Rebels use X-Wings or the other fight fighter craft piloted by R2 units to kamikaze into Star Destroyers and perform extensive hit-and-run missions against the Super Imperial Fleet? And the, the truth is, is that these are all questions that are now validly being asked because that is the nonsense that Ryan Johnson has brought into Star Wars. This is the reason why when everyone says, at first when people told me this, they said, oh, hyperspace ram, it ruined everything. I said to myself, yeah, I mean, I can understand why you might, didn't, you might not like it. It doesn't make a lot of sense, etc. But then when I actually started to think about it, I realized, no, wait a minute. When you break this thing down, you understand, no, this actually breaks Star Wars. This just breaks the narrative of Star Wars in so many different ways. And it's just so infuriating because then you realize, wow, The Last Jedi really was a piece of trash film. You can still like it, but from a narrative perspective, it is garbage. So the fact that this screenplay with hyperspace ramming won an award, a Saturn Award of all things, boggles my mind and also shows you that these people would rather would rather push their own political narratives would rather support people who support their own political narratives than actually award great storytelling because this is obviously <sighs> all right as one can see the contradictions in plot logic <laughs> <laughs> now abound in the Star Wars universe due to the introduction of the Holdo Maneuver in The Last Jedi. Whether or not parts of Star Wars audiences can excuse these new contradictions in the saga's internal continuity is immaterial, because there will always be segments of the audience who cannot dismiss these now narrative-breaking errors in consistency, thus ruining not just The Last Jedi for those members of the audience, but actively ruining all movies in the Star Wars franchise. And people can say, oh, I'm still fine with it, but you cannot defend from a narrative perspective how this works. How, that, how you cannot go back to every film that came before and every film going forward and say, okay, then just hyperspace ram them. And if it's a movie, and also when you introduce this topic too, then all Star Wars should be then is hyperspace rams, and that is boring. Narratively speaking, that is lazy and boring. So yeah, I really think that this guy, Ryan Johnson, thought to himself, this would be a cool moment without thinking about what he was actually doing. Why? Because he himself admitted it. He's not a good storyteller. He's even said that about himself. He can't He can't write screenplays. And it's obvious here because of this nonsense. All right, and this is where he gets into Defenders. So some of the, some of the most obvious things, or rather some of the most uh, common excuses that people will say to try and explain it, say, oh, well, look cool. No one said this couldn't ever happen before. The characters in the previous movies didn't know about it. And then the Rebels Resistance can't afford to sacrifice their ships like this all the time. And of course, you can just, you know, dive right into those. Anyway, many proponents of this justification like to point a scene to the, uh, so one of these in particular, so obviously you have it look cool, that's the one that most people go to, oh, look cool, all right, you can like it, that's your subjective opinion, but objectively you cannot defend it, but then also like no one said it ever happened before, the characters didn't know about it, etc., these are all things that he's going to point out, saying many proponents of this justification like to point to a scene in the climactic space battle of Return of the Jedi, where an A-wing pilot makes a suicide run... <laughs> on the bridge of the Super Star Destroyer Executor as an example of Holdo-type maneuver existing before The Last Jedi. However, it was established in that scene that the suicide run was only possible once the Executor's shield generators had been destroyed and the bridge was unprotected. It was the Executor's shields which prevented other starfighters from engaging in kamikaze runs on its command center. So it could be argued that shields protect starships against light speed impacts. And if this is the case, it would make sense as to why this technique was not employed in the past. Due to every ship base in some planets and Star Wars universe operating some type of shield technology, and also it's been established that the ships that were being uh, the ship that got kamikaze in the Holdo movement in the Holdo moment uh, had its shields up. So again, if you're gonna talk about this and break this down further and try to defend it, it creates so many more problems for yourself in the long run. 
Another big part of it is going back to the Canto Bite scene. The Last Jedi establishes that a war economy exists, again, because they're selling to both sides of the argument. They're, they're both selling to the Resistance and also the First Order. Seeing as how unmanned light speed projectiles would be extremely powerful weapons coveted by both sides, external consistency dictates, so again, getting into other types of consistency here, that there would not only be a market for these types of weapons, but also someone willing to supply them. And if there are unmanned versions of light speed vehicles available, then one cannot argue that using them would be too costly in terms of lives or resources. Again, if it's a common way, if, if it's something that is the best way to win a fight, then it's going to be readily available, which means that you're going to be able to get it for a lot cheaper than building those giant ships, those giant bombers that can somehow drop magnetic bombs. I mean, <laughs> it makes a hell of a lot more sense if you do it that way. Even if a large capital-sized ship was necessary to make a significant impact, they could be far cheaper to produce than a fully functional capital ship, simply due to the fact that they don't need to be designed for anything other than accelerating hyper, uh, the accelerating to light speed. Uh, one need only a droid to pilot it at life uh, at, at a target no life support systems crew quarters shielding or weaponry ne exactly no weaponry necessary either exactly so why uh, i've just i my brain is mush now uh, we're almost gone, guys. All right, so the real issue here is now that light speed, uh, that now the element of light speed weaponization has been introduced within the narrative, is officially considered to be canon. And when a canonical element creates numerous instances of self-contradictions within a story's internal consistency, it has to be addressed in future installments of the narrative, thus creating a need for retroactive continuity, or what we call retcon. So that's the reason why not only does this need to be retcon for any other future Star Wars film to actually make sense, but you also, therefore, need to understand that this has caused a severe problem. This has caused now an unfixable problem unless it is addressed in future installments. And at this point, I don't see how or why JJ, or at least the higher ups, would ever allow JJ to, to basically do away with something that Ryan Johnson did. Because at this point, it seems like they're trying to protect Ryan Johnson, saying, no, he made a great film and we're proud of what he did. Now, whether or not behind the scenes they're saying a different story, I don't know. I honestly think that Ryan Johnson's done, just like I think Kathleen Kennedy's done, and maybe they're going to give the oh, go ahead to JJ to actually start trying and fix these issues that happened in episode eight. But this is one of them that no question needs to be fixed because this one scene, this one moment, just destroys the narrative of Star Wars. In essence, proper storycraft demands that the narrative ration, uh, rationality of the Holdo maneuver now can be officially addressed in future Star Wars canonical entries in order to fix the contradictions it created in the saga's internal consistency. Without doing so, audiences will continue to break the willing suspension of disbelief while watching Star Wars movies. Every time an epic space battle appears in the narrative, a large portion of the audience will be forced to ask, and this is what I'm going to ask in every single movie going forward, why don't you just use a hyperspace ram to win? Seeing that every film so far has had some giant thing that needs to be destroyed, if they take an entire movie to find a way to find the one weakness of it the whole time and say, find a hyperspace ram, use a hyperspace ram. Now, every time that happens going forward and every time that we watch the old films, that question is going to be asked. It is important to remember that a storyteller's primary job is to entertain his or her audience. Stories are meant to be immersive to the point where the audience forgets it's being told, uh, that it's that it's being it's told a story. The goal of storytellers is to ensure that the largest audience possible gets a good experience from their narrative. Aside from the targeting of a specific audience, the general audience is always what a storyteller must keep in mind. And it's obvious that Ryan Johnson did not care about that. He did not want to make a story for the audience. He's made that very clear, as a lot of people at Lucasfilm have. They made it for them. They made it for their art. They made it to make their own points. But the problem when you do that with Star Wars is that you can do that with your own small indie film because the people who see it are going to be expecting to have their uh, to have their expectations subverted and for narrative uh, for narrative plot devices not to make any sense. But when you use in a Star Wars film that has a large history, you break the entire history. And that's the reason why, instead of looking out for the good of the audience, instead of trying to make the audience, the general audience, as happy, Ryan Johnson just had, oh, well, I want to put this in the movie, so I'm just going to do it. Just disregarding the fact that it had the impact that it did, not only on the fans, but also on the actual story itself. Particularly with the franchises below to Star Wars, since its inception, Star Wars was always meant to have a broad appeal. It was not a niche film designed for a specific type of audience. It was conceptualized by creator George Lucas to be a fairy tale for all ages and all demographics. In short, it was a narrative meant to be enjoyed by all. And that's a very good point. This story, this series, was meant to be seen and enjoyed by all people. Not just the art house critics, stuck-up snobby critics who love this film. But for general audiences, that 50-50% split that we had with The Last Jedi, you could say all you want about saying, oh, those numbers are fixed. The fact is, is that if you talk to most people out there, most people, I would say, 
a very large portion at least, will have problems with Last Jedi. They might not say they hate The Last Jedi, but they will have problems from a narrative perspective. And if you tell them this, more often than not, they're going to say, oh God, I never thought of it before. That's a problem. Or say, oh yeah, that's true, but I don't care. I enjoyed the film. Remember, that's one of the top defenses that they have for this moment in particular. And that's problematic for the story going forward. And then lastly, this is not to say The Last Jedi cannot be considered an entertaining film, but it can be considered to be flawed and poorly written one. Any story that can affect the internal consistency of everything that came before it to such a degree is objectively an example of bad storycraft. In the shaping and telling of a narrative, storytellers must always factor in what came before, what may, be, what may come after, and the audience experience of what they intend to share. To not do so can be detrimental to the audience's enjoyment of the narrative to the point where it actually alienates audiences and encourages them to stop wanting the experience future installments of the narrative. In his failure to employ proper storycraft, Ryan Johnson did terrible damage to the narrative of the Star Wars saga. Let's hope it is not beyond fixing. And unless they retcon it, unless they retcon this and a lot of other things that Ryan Johnson did, it might just be too late to save it. But I will say this, and this is a very great point that he makes at the very end, which is that this is not to say, and this video is not me saying you have to hate The Last Jedi. I will never force anyone or want to force anyone to believe something or to accept something that is not a part of their reality. It's part of my reality. I think The Last Jedi is awful. I think that it's done terrible things for Star Wars. So if your subjective opinion is that you like it, great. I'm happy that you like it. I'm happy that you're able to find some joy in it. I wish that I could. But the problem is, is that, and this is something that you cannot deny, you cannot ignore is that there are severe, objective flaws with this film. From a storytelling perspective, there are severe storytelling flaws within this film. You cannot deny that. You cannot act like they don't exist. You cannot simply ignore them because they have caused so many problems, not just for the previous films, not just for that film, but for all future films too. So again, if you like it, great. If you enjoyed it, fantastic. I'm glad that you found joy in it. But do not for a second. Try and make the excuse saying, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It absolutely does. All right, guys, so what are y'all's thoughts on this? Once again, I think Matthew Kadish just knocks it out of the park. I know I spent a lot of time on this, but I always want to try and give the best I can to these articles because I really do think there's just so much great material in them. It all just, it all works so well together. And this isn't even the whole article. There's just so much more content that I wasn't even able to cover in this video as long as it is. So please check out the link that I post, uh, that I'm going to post in the, uh, <laughs> in the description of the video. It's just great. It's fantastic. Go check Matthew Kadish out on Twitter as well. He's just a really nice guy and he just really knows what he's talking about. And I cannot wait to see what more, uh, what more he puts out, not only about The Last Jedi, but also about other films in general, because he cares about storycraft. He cares about narrative. He cares about objective flaws within narrative and how they have a broader impact on film franchises and also on the films themselves in general. So if you like this video, guys, please hit that thumbs up. Please hit that subscribe if you haven't done so already. We just hit over 2,600 people. And also, I just want to say thank you so much last night i had some amazing people uh with these <laughs> amazing super chats coming in um and i you know you know who you are i shouted you out on the video and you can rewatch it for yourself to see and there are just so many amazing people over this channel i do live streams almost every night and every single night we have fun we have a blast it's a great community it's a small community but we all get along very well, and we don't agree on everything, but we get along very well, and it's a lot of fun. So please consider joining our live streams. It's a lot of fun, and you can follow me on Twitter to find out more about when those will be, and I will hope to see you there. So guys, thank you all so much for watching. Have a great day, and as always, God bless.